Hello everyone, today I'm going to be talking about feminist challenges to sociology and in particular I'm going to give some ideas about the work of Dorothy E. Smith who is a Canadian feminist sociologist, also run through a few changes that feminist sociology has brought to sociology and also want to review Barbara Risman's theory of gender structure in action she's done she has a theory and then she's applied that theory to some research but a point I want to make first is go back a little bit in time and stress that there have always been women in sociology even if their work has not been acknowledged or recognized or appreciated later on it's important to remember that when sociology was developing as a university discipline back in the 1800s women couldn't get usually a university education and if they didn't have a university education then they couldn't teach in a university and if they couldn't teach in a university then they couldn't influence the development of a university discipline which is a really interesting observation given that Karl Marx was university educated to a PhD level but never taught in a university. Apparently he was way too radical for the universities of his time because he tried for an academic job but ended up as a journalist. Anyway, since it was the men making decisions about university disciplines, it's not surprising that women who were influential outside of the university weren't recognised within universities and weren't included when textbooks were written about the history and development of sociology. Harriet Martineau, as you would know, was a contemporary of August Comte, who, as you would also know, coined the term sociology and believed that we could study society in the same way that natural scientists studies what's called the natural or the non-human world. Harriet Martineau was born 16 years before Karl Marx and was publishing on political economy before he was at university. As Mary Jo Deacon says, Harriet Martineau dared to write and she dared to write about her views on society and in support of daring young field of knowledge, sociology. Before Marx, Durkheim and Weber, Martineau was writing about gender, crime, class, suicide, religion, nationalism and health. And she also wrote a translation into English of Comte's work on positive philosophy. I had to laugh when I read the first sentence of her translation because it's so not true today. She writes, it may appear strange that in these days when the French language is almost as familiar to English readers as their own, I should have spent many months in rendering into English a work which presents no difficulties of language and which is undoubtedly known to all philosophical students. According to the preface, Martineau's intention in translating this work in 1852 was to make it widely available and that's a feature of her work that she wanted to reach a wide audience making her writing accessible. She prefigures, I think, contemporary emphases on academics having an impact in the wider community and not just keeping research and writings to the academic community. In her writing on gender and her concern about the working conditions of women in factories, she also prefigures the first and second wave feminist movements, even if she's not too sure about women's suffrage. Harriet Martineau was also an interdisciplinary scholar ranging across a number of areas, and that I think makes her a forerunner for the sort of interdisciplinary work we're often encouraged to do today. From the period 1840 to 1890, Harriet Martineau is the woman most obviously connected to sociology. American sociologist Mary Jo Deegan reckons there was a golden era of women in sociology from the period 1890 to 1920. Then there was the rise of the Chicago School, which I'll talk about in a minute. I think her book that I've pictured here, Women in Sociology, is really a must-have for any feminist sociologist. The women working in sociology in this golden era include women like Jane Addams, who headed up Hull House in Chicago, which Deegan says was the first major women's sociological institution. Jane Addams and other women such as Edith Abbott, Julia Lathrop and Florence Kelly also form part of what Anthony Blasey calls in his preamble to part one of diverse histories of American sociology, and that part one is called Sociology for Social Reform. The women form part of the social science movement of the 19th century because that movement included more than research and teaching. It included, and I'm quoting, philanthropic works, communes, settlement houses like Hull House and social activism. 
At the time of Jane Addams, sociology was in its infancy. Having a university degree and teaching in the academy while publishing in relevant journals was part of it, sure. But so too were the settlement houses like Hull House, where citizens contributed to the development of sociology as much as did the educated elite. Robert E. Park, however, who was influential in the Chicago School of Sociology from 1914 to 1933, was also keen on academic sociology becoming the hegemonic form of sociology. He wanted to focus on sociology as a science, whereby sociologists observe society but don't seek to change it. According to Mary Jo Deegan, Robert E. Park particularly criticised the work of female sociologists who applied their sociological knowledge. These women changed American society and instituted a plethora of laws and government programs concerning the rights of workers, immigrants, the disabled, children and mothers. These sociologists were fundamental to the creation of the welfare state in the United States. Park's derision of applied sociologists included calling them social workers, and it meant that he disregarded the work of many applied sociologists over decades. This for Deegan is evidence of Park's gender bias. He decried applied sociology if it was conducted by women, but not if it was carried out by him. It was okay for Park to set up Park House in 1924, built on the same settlement house model run by Jane Addams, and to sign on as faculty at Fisk University, an historically black university, after he retired, which he did as part of his commitment to studying and improving the lives of African Americans. But he never acknowledged that he was doing applied sociology. Others went on to follow Park's lead in what Deegan calls the dark era of patriarchal ascendancy from the period 1920 to 1965. As the Chicago school flourished and dominated the profession worldwide from the end of World War I until the beginning of World War II, it also spearheaded the elimination of women in sociology, and I'm quoting from Mary Jo Deegan there. From the 1920s, women who entered the field were second-class citizens, and those who had done well during the Golden Age went into other fields, especially social work. Hence Mary Jo Deegan's book, Women in Sociology, which is a collection of short-form biographies of women sociologists, beginning with Harriet Martineau and ending with Dorothy E. Smith, and I'm going to be talking about Dorothy Smith's work in a minute. Female sociologists, concludes Mary Jo Deegan, have changed the world, even though many of their names are unknown or not widely known in sociology. Dorothy e. Smith. She's had a very long and distinguished career as an academic. She's been very much shaped by the women's liberation movement, which was sparked, some would say, by the publication of Betty Friedan's 1963 book, The Feminist Mystique. And in that book, Betty Friedan talked about the problem that problem that has no name, the situation of many middle class American women who gave up their education, their careers to stay at home and raise children, which for many of them was a very stifling occupation. And the book did become a bestseller. So I just want to say there that there always have been women in the workforce, the always working class women, for example, have always needed to be in the workforce. Uh, so we're talking about women who didn't need to, for financial reasons, need to be out doing paid work. And the culture was very much that women should stay at home if they were able financially to do that. Informed by the women's movement, Dorothy Smith began to notice something strange about her own experience. Uh, she was actually born, I think I said she's Canadian, but in actual fact, she was born in England. She had her PhD. She did that from the University of California, back Berkeley. But in 1967, she moved to Vancouver and taught at the University of British Columbia. And then a bit later uh, on in 1977, she moved to Toronto and she was working there in the Institute for Studies in Education. So she noticed that, so, so we're now talking at the beginning of her career as a sociologist and we're talking about California and then later on Canada where she would go to work as a sociologist you know doing her PhD and then a little bit later on 
And what she observed in herself is that she had two modes of consciousness, two ways of being in the world. And she called this a bifurcated consciousness. So she had a work as an ac academic and what she noticed that it was organized textually. And by by that I mean she was always reading books or writing books, reading papers or writing papers. And it was also organized conceptually, very much focused on ideas and theories. And it seemed to her to be independent of the local and particular. And she noticed that because her life as a single mother, where she cleaned, prepared and cooked food, put children to bed, she had two small boys, played with them, got mad at them. It was a whole life of particulars, a particular park she went to, particular illnesses that she and her children had, particular walks that the family went on. And what she noticed was that she really liked going from that academic setting and then coming down to earth in this other life that she had as a mother. And so that's what she called bifurcated consciousness. She saw that when she went to work, she was also transgressing a gender boundary. So in her work as an academic, it was an intellectual world which actually appeared genderless, but when you took a little bit more notice, there were more than 40 men working there and only two women, and those two women were on temporary contracts. And that it was a very much a male world in all of its assumptions, interests, perspectives, discourses. So women were the other. In her life as a single mother, however, that was very much a time where women's work was as the nurturers and carers. So we're talking back in the 1960s and in the 1970s. And that she called the gender boundary, dividing those two worlds, that bifurcated consciousness. On the one hand, her life as a single mother, which was down to earth, was very much a, a female domain. And her work, her abstract work in the university was very much a male domain. She then went on to talk about, and she's written, uh, written about this over a number of years, the relations of, of ruling. And she's interested in the intersection of the institutions which do the organizing and regulating of society and their gender subtext and their basis in a gender division of labor. And by ruling, she means the government, law, business, economics, finance, management, all professional organisations, our educational institutes, institutions, and the various discourses that we have in texts and documents. And it's the practice of the rule that standardises, makes general, that particular and local. So when we read a book, we're talking about a large group of people and they are kind of all generalised. And then we're standardised. Think about the education system, for example, that standardises students, uh, even think down to, and I'm thinking up to at least the end of high school, think also even of the standardisation in terms of the clothes that you wear. But so it standardises things that otherwise are quite particular and local. So the government administration, all of that management work is done via communication. Therefore, the ruling is done via words, numbers, images on paper, these days, of course, in computers or on the TV screen or on movie screen. And it's written and organised by people like me, academics, teachers, journalists, writers, filmmakers, publishers, advertisers, etc. And it shapes how we think about ourselves, how we think about other people, so it can shape how we think about ourselves and others, how we should look, our homes, how we live, and what we think. All of sociology, she says, is implicated in the relations of ruling, but sociologists have the power to describe, to analyse, and to categorise, which in turn then contributes to society, so she's talking about sociology particularly here, and women were left out of that. So sociology is part of the relations of ruling. And gender, she says, is invisible because the relations of ruling are of course objectified, impersonal, and they claim universality. So men claim to represent the masculine and the neutral, they stand humanity, and women get confined to the subjective. So she writes, we are looking at a gender organisation of the apparently neutral and impersonal rationality of the ruling apparatus, the male subtext concealed beneath its apparently impersonal forms is integral, but not accidental, 
women were excluded from the practices of power within these textually mediated relations of ruling. And she says that authority is a form of power. It is about the capacity to get things done and men have authority as members of a group. So they're invested with authority as individuals through that membership and invested with authority of institutionalized structures as well. And she writes, this is why we have a sociology that is written from the position of from the perspective of positions in a male dominated ruling class and is set up in terms of the relevances of the institutional power structures that constitute these positions. She's arguing of course for a sociology for women and she has this metaphor of a dance that we can join a dance, move with the dance, but we can't see how the dance was organised actually in the first place. Sociology from the standpoint of women as outside the extra local relations of ruling is what's needed and the everyday world therefore becomes the focus of sociological attention it becomes problematic which is the name of one of her books in our research we begin with the everyday world which is local particular embodied and of course has an historical context as well but we don't stay there we extend our analysis out to make visible the relations of ruling. She gives an example of how a working class woman in England during the 20th, 20th century, so of her every day, so she's called Mrs. T, and her daily life is structured around organisations or these relations of ruling that are beyond her, her narrow domestic world. It's not organised in the way that she might want it organised. Instead, it's organised around her husband's job. She's responsible for getting him fed and off to work, getting him dinner when he gets in for work, but she doesn't decide when her husband goes to work. That's decided externally or extra locally. It's organised also around her children's schooling. She gets the children up and fed and off to school. She makes them lunch, she brings them back home and gives them food when they return home at the end of the day. And those times are organised by educational institutions, not by her. Even the fact that the children have to go to school is organised externally to her. And she has to do at home um, the homework or, you know, organise, facilitate the homework that the school sets for her child as well. So this is all done, of course, at a particular point in historical time, and it'll be affected by historical changes. So there was a time, of course, when children didn't go off to school, and then they went to school for half a day, and then they went to school for a whole day, and then they went to school until they were 13, then 15, now 17, I'm th thinking there, of mandatory schooling ages. So most of that woman's day is organised by the ruling relations, which are external to her, and she has to organise her day around that. Dorothy Smith's work has been very influential and has been taken up and theorised, along with the ideas of Patricia Hill Collins and others, as feminist standpoint theory, which is an approach to research which explores relationships between knowledge and power, and it assumes that epistemology, or what we know, is inseparable from politics. It's research that starts from the perspective of the marginalised, it deconstructs the idea of the all-knowing feminist. So the feminist researchers, we acknowledge, know from a partial and specific social location. It's research that's grounded in women's experiences, including bodies and emotions, and it takes into account diversity or what we might call intersectionality. So therefore doesn't ignore power relationships between women. As you'll hear from the following, there has been criticism of feminist standpoint theory and development in that approach too, which will lead us nicely into talking about the impact of second wave feminism on sociology. Standpoint feminism is a theory that feminist social science should be practiced from the standpoint of women or particular groups of women. As some scholars, for example Patricia Hill Collins and Dorothy Smith, say that they are better equipped to understand some aspects of the world. A feminist or women's standpoint epistemology proposes to make women's experiences the point of departure, in addition to, and sometimes instead of men's. Dorothy Smith, teaching at University of California at Berkeley when the women's movement was in its early stages, looked at the experience of female academics and began to ask about life stories of these women. 
As a feminist inspired by Karl Marx, Smith turned her attention to the development of a sociology for women. She founded feminist standpoint theory which looked at the social world from the perspectives of women in their everyday worlds and the ways in which women socially construct their worlds. As theorized by Nancy Hartzik in 1983, standpoint feminism is founded in Marxist ideology. Hartzik argued that a feminist standpoint could be built out of Marx's understanding of experience and used to criticize patriarchal theories. Hence, a feminist standpoint is essential to examining the systemic oppressions in a society that standpoint feminist Sadie values women's knowledge. Standpoint feminism makes the case that because women's lives and roles in almost all societies are significantly different from men's, women hold a different type of knowledge. Their location as a subordinated group allows women to see and understand the world in ways that are different and challenging to the existing male-biased conventional wisdom. Standpoint feminism unites several feminist epistemologies. Standpoint feminist theorists attempt to criticize dominant conventional epistemologies in the social and natural sciences, as well as defend the coherence of feminist knowledge. Initially, Feminist standpoint theories addressed women's standing in the sexual division of labor. Standpoint theorists such as Donna Haraway saw to show standpoint as the notion of situated knowledge. To counter the apparent relativism of standpoint theory. This theory is considered to have potentially radical consequences because of the focus on power and the fact that it challenges the idea of an essential truth, especially the hegemonic reality created passed down and imposed by those in power. Criticism of standpoint feminism has come from postmodern feminists, who argue that there is no concrete women's experience from which to construct knowledge. In other words, the lives of women across space and time are so diverse it is impossible to generalize about their experiences. Standpoint feminism has absorbed this criticism, to an extent. Many standpoint feminists now recognize that because of the many differences that divide women it is impossible to claim one single or universal women's experience. Because sexism does not occur in a vacuum, it is important to view it in relation to other systems of domination and to analyze how it interacts with racism, homophobia, colonialism, and classism in a matrix of domination. Contemporary standpoint feminist theory perceives that it is a relational standpoint, rather than arising inevitably from the experience of women. See difference feminism. Standpoint feminists have recently argued that individuals are both oppressed in some situations and in relation to some people while at the same time are privileged in others. Their goal is to situate women and men within multiple systems of domination in a way that is more accurate and more able to confront oppressive power structures. One of the critiques of this stance is that such an intense focus on the many differences between women obliterates the very similarities that might bond women together. If this is that case, trying to create a broad-based feminist community or building consensus on specific policy becomes problematic. Since Dorothy Smith's time, there has been quite a lot of work done in sociology, and feminist sociology has certainly drawn on uh, feminist debates on sexual difference, and, and there's various traditions there as well. So the humanism, which emphasizes sameness rather than difference, Gynocentrism, which emphasizes on different and celebrated. Postmodernism, where we critically reflect on different. And critical feminism, which is kind of alliances, I guess, between women and men in struggles against depression. And it's been informed by a whole lot of different feminist theoretical perspectives. And I'm sure that you're familiar with these, the idea of liberal or reformist feminist theory, radical feminism, Marxist feminism, which we've talked about briefly, dual systems or socialist feminism, postmodern feminism, feminist critical theory, and black and post-colonial feminism. Sociology is very different now to when Dorothy Smith came in. 30 years later. It is still a male-dominated field of study if you look at most of the books and academic papers produced and the figures who are very dominant, 
but mostly we have female students. That issue of sexual difference is no longer ignored. And I've taken this from Abbott Wallace and Tyler's work on feminist sociology. And I guess that's, you know, 2005, that's getting a little bit old. So maybe that's changed. But they contended that studies continued to focus on men and boys, ignoring women and girls, or adding women and girls without changing theories. And feminist thought too often seen as an addendum, an option instead of a core, as something that female lecturers teach. And certainly that was my experience as a student, that it was added in unless you were taking women's studies courses or gender studies courses. And of course, we have seen the rise of men's studies and gender studies and the decline of women's studies now right across the world. Sociology 30 years later, uh, feminist perspectives have definitely made a difference. What's included now are studies around sexuality in the body, identity and difference, and visual and cultural sociology, which weren't there or not much previously. And feminist sociology has had an impact as well in terms of what we might be studying. So a lot more work on health and illness, family and domestic work, employment and organisation and how that impacts education, age and the life course and the mass media and how that impacts on us. So it's certainly those feminist perspectives are across all of those areas and has, has transformed, I think, sociology. There is, are still concerned that feminist perspectives are not incorporated into issues of social class and stratification, although, of course, Beverly Skeggs in the United Kingdom has done quite a bit of work around that. Then when it comes to political sociology, that we're not using uh, much in the way of feminist perspectives, and the same with so sociological theory as well. So perhaps we'll have a discussion about what you think about that on your travels through sociology classes in the University of Adelaide. It's kind of been three responses to this feminist challenge to sociology. There's the idea of integration, separatism and reconceptualization. So integration is about reforming existing ideas and approaches. The main problem with that is that often women continue to be marginalised. The idea of separatism tends to continue the marginalisation of women, but it also celebrates it. So, you, so males, what's called male stream sociology is left to do the real sociology and we can't ignore men or ignore the ways in which men dominate, ex exploit and subordinate women. So there are issues with separatism as well. Reconceptualisation emphasises the reconstruction of sociology, which means that what we want is a total rethinking so that women are incorporated adequately. But there are many sociologists who are resistant to this idea. And if you have any doubt about that, then I'd suggest having a look at some textbooks. There are, there are definitely feminist sociological textbooks, and I've mentioned one of those earlier. That's a little bit dated now. I haven't found anything that's kind of a bit more up to date. But many of the other textbooks, honestly, they're just, and I was required to teach a course a few years ago, and this course was initially based on really just a list of men. And that's no, not intended to offend any men in the audience, but it is to say, come on, that's ridiculous. We can't possibly be teaching sociology at third year with just this list of male uh, theorists and most if not all of those men came from North America and Europe to boot so it was very narrow. So now I just want to introduce Barbara Risman if you haven't come across her already um, and her idea of gender as a social structure and she's an example I think of rethinking sociology. She was born in 1956 and she was the child of Jewish migrants to the United States, continuing what I see as a pattern of Jewish scholars within the tradition anyway. She's currently head of sociology at the University of Illinois in Chicago, which is a very nice connection with our Chicago uh, school. And she, her theory is drawn on in a number of studies that she's done, hooking up, the, hooking up culture, men cooking, sexual violence, housework, etc. 
So what she says is that as societies have a political structure and an economic structure, they also have a gender structure. And by gender structure, she means the way in which bodies are assigned a sex category, usually female and male, from which gender as inequality is built. And a gender structure therefore has implications for individuals and their identities, their personalities, and therefore the choices they make. And she suggests doing analyses at three levels of this gender structure, individual level, the interactional level, and we talked about that in terms of symbolic interactionism. And in there should be thinking about uh, cultural expectations, taken for granted meanings that we have so now, but often it has been taken for granted that it would be women, for example, who would stay home and be the primary care of, of children. At another level, so you can see the macro level influencing both the individual level and the interactional level with socialisation and cultural expectation. And then at another level, she says we need to look at institutions and we need to consider the distribution of material advantage, how organisations are actually organised and the discourses. And I think that you can see feminists have been doing some of that. Thinking about the material advantage, for example, the gender pay gap is an example of that. So you can see that her ideas are not uncommon anymore. We've certainly taken them on board and they've been spread through other theorists as well. She reckons that while people have long focused at that individual level, of course, the gender structure goes well beyond that. And so while we would do analysis at, of bodywork, for example, at that individual level, every time we meet another person or even imagine in our minds an encounter, there are expectations attached to our sex category. And we're held accountable to those expectations whether we meet them or not. So that's at that middle level, the interactional level of analysis. And things to be looking for in doing an analysis are access to social networks, proportionate representation, which we hear a lot of in Australia, particularly around the, at the moment, the number of women who are in parliament, stereotypes, cognitive bias, othering, etc. However, that other level, the macro level, we also need to consider religion, our legal system, all of which of course have been patriarchal, have been based on men ruling, men dominating the relations of ruling, and all of which have beliefs about male privilege and agency on the one hand and about women as nurturers and carers. So that is that is why we need to consider the distribution of those material resources and why it is that if you're in unpaid work, staying at home, you're unlikely to be getting paid for doing work that actually has a value to the community and, and to the economy as well, according to some. So she uses, Barbara Risman uses this theory to analyse millennials as emerging adults. So young adults at this particular historical moment when young people stay at home for longer as a general rule, often well into their uh, 20s, even into their 30s. Um, the social processes involved in this very long transition to adulthood in American society, because she is American, is more individuated today and includes a whole lot of identity work as a feature particularly including identity struggles around sexuality and gender. So what she did was use life history interviews done in 2013 of a sample of 116 young people in America. They were aged between 18 and 30. They were living in and around the city of Chicago. They were mostly college students or recent graduates. Slightly less than a third were male, the rest were female. And in the group, there were three trans women and three trans men. The group were ethnically diverse. They were white dominated with 43%, 9% black, 22% Asian, 17% uh, who identified as Latino and about 18 8%, which was a mix of others, mostly from the Middle East. Of the group, 72% identified as, um, as heterosexual, 11 identified as gay, 22% as a mix of, of other sort of sexual identities, including bisexual, queer, pansexual, etc. Wasn't very class diverse. Most of the group were first generation college students from working class backgrounds. She ended up dividing up her group into 
after analysing their life histories, dividing them up into four groups. And first of all, there were the what she calls the true believers, and the number of those was 30 in the sample. And she says at this macro level, I guess the word she would use is at that institutional level, gender just is and should be. This is for the true believers. This group believe in the gender ideology that women and men should be different. And often there's a religious component and they accept religious rules regarding gender segregation and differentiation. And often that sort of called women are different but equal. And there's certainly been lots of arguments within theology and gender, uh, religious studies arguing against whether it's possible for women to be different and yet equal. But that is one of the concerns, particularly, and I think within most religious faiths as well, not just within what's called the Abrahamic religions. At the next level down, the interactional level, so this is where we're having interactions with other people and coming up against their expectations. This group generally experienced intentional gender-specific socialisation. So they were socialised around this thing that women and men should be different and that there should be at times gender segregation. So not only were they experiencing quite intentional socialisation around that, but there was also lots of gender policing to reinforce that socialisation as well. So, for example, if a little girl did want to get a hair cut short, then she would be told that that's not appropriate for a girl. At the individual level, so thinking about them as individual people, then she found that they tended to internalise gender not as a structure, but as a personality trait. And they tended to carefully follow gendered behavioural norms as well. And they don't like their bodies, but she found that within other groups as well. But in this group, that was, that was quite a, a strong finding. The next group were the innovators with a number of 21. At that macro level, she found these young people were consistently critical of the gender structure. They reject gender essentialism, saying that we are essentially different. They rejected sexism. At the interactional level, though, they do feel constrained by expectations around gender. Men experienced gender policing, and that was mostly around what they did, around their behaviour. So if they wanted to play with dolls, for example, as children, then they would get told off for that. Women experienced gender policing, and that was mostly around their appearance. So if they were inappropriately wearing a short haircut, for example, or that was seen as inappropriate. They were actually trying to work, uh, define new expectations about gender for themselves and for others in, in interaction with others. At the individual level, what they did was reject cultural beliefs in sexism. They tended to mix and match gendered behaviours. So men, for example, rejected hegemonic masculinity. Women might reject hyperfemininity. They don't reject, however, the material embodiment of how they present themselves as female or male. Then she had the rebels, which was a smaller group, and the number of those was 17. Ten of this group did identify as genderqueer. They reject gender as a binary, rejecting womanhood and manhood, femininity and masculinity, as they are currently defined in the gender structure. So at that macro level, they reject the gender structure. They feel oppressed by social institutions because of the gender structure, and they hold change the world views. That's what they wanted to do, change the world. At the interaction level, what they did was experience very high levels of gender policing, but they also had a commitment to pushing back against the gender binary. So they were resisting that policing they were encountering. And at the individual level, they rejected social expectations for the way in which they presented their bodies and they lived between the binary of female and male. They also tended to mix and match from traditionally female and male personality traits and behaviours as well. And in her last group, which was a very large group of 48, she had a group that she called the Straddlers. And this group held contradictory beliefs. They weren't always consistent. So at the macro level, they're actually not sure really anymore of what's expected of them. Interestingly, men didn't experience social institutions as gendered. At the interaction level, men 
still expected to be a, a breadwinner and they experienced a lot of gender policing by their peers. So around expressing their feelings, what they wore, what sort of sport or other activities they engaged in, uh, what they did, their behaviour. Women were very much socialised to be feminine, were expected to be pretty, they had far less in their families, they had far less freedom than their brothers. They expected to do well at school though and have a career. And at the individual level they lived within the rules but but also rejected some and that because they really unlike unlike the rebels they really don't want to make waves so that's why she called them the straddlers she does stress in her book which is on the reading list for the book review if you're interested she does stress that none of these groups are neat and tidy but it wasn't really hard for me to imagine how you could do this sort of study within Australia for example and come up with perhaps very similar findings. So this is where Barbara Risman ends up. She's calling for a social movement for freedom from gender. What she wants to do is make overt genderism unacceptable. She wants us to experiment with institutions in a post-gender way. She wants no correlation between sex at birth and then gendered expectations. And she wants new gender-free pronouns for us all. And she really wants feminist scholarship to go beyond women's studies and gender studies programs, which in some ways it does, and in other ways it doesn't. In sum, for this week, sociology has changed and definitely incorporated ideas from feminist scholars. Dorothy Smith was absolutely in the vanguard of changes to sociology. And Barbara Risman's Gender as Social Structure is an example of rethinking sociology. So thanks very much for listening.